The nicknames of historical figures often refer to ethnicity. Most times it is their own, like Maximinus Thrax or Leo the Armenian. But on rare occasions, military commanders distinguished themselves in battles against certain enemy so much that they were awarded nicknames reflecting how good they were at killing those people. My personal favorite of these titles is The Pale Death of the Saracens, which was held by Nikephoros Phokas. But in today's video I'm going to discuss two other figures. Their monikers mirror each other, and I thought it'd be interesting to analyze how they came about. The subjects of this video are the Roman Emperor Basil II the Bulgar Slayer, and the Bulgarian Tsar Kaloyan the Roman Slayer. Let's start with Basil. Basil II was the Eastern Roman Emperor from 976 to 1025. He's one of the most important figures in the Empire's history, and his legacy is much more than just military victories. Today, however, I'm going to focus specifically on his campaigns against the Bulgarian Empire, which earned him his title. Before Basil became the sole ruler of the Empire, the Romans and the Bulgars had been warring for a long time. Basil's regent John Zemiskis had some success at putting the Bulgarian Empire under the symbolic protectorate of Constantinople. He held the Bulgarian Tsar Boris II and his brother captive, and in 971 divested Boris of his imperial regalia as a symbolic termination of the First Bulgarian Empire. Despite this, the Bulgars remained de facto independent and continued to raid Roman territory. In 977, the Byzantines released Bulgarian Tsar and his brother in an attempt to assert control over the Bulgars. But Tsar Boris was shot in an accident. His brother Roman was a eunuch, and although he became a nominal emperor, he didn't have any real power. All the affairs of the state were left in the hands of a young noble, Samuel, who was also named the successor to the throne. Taking advantage of the revolt in Anatolia, the Bulgars took over the city of Larissa in Thessaly. Bulgar raids continued largely unopposed, until in 986 Basil finally dealt with the internal unrest and diverted his attention to the west. His first direct encounter with the Bulgars was a failure. In 986 he unsuccessfully besieged Sredets, modern-day Sophia, and on his way back to Thrace, fell into an ambush at the gates of Trajan. Basil escaped capture, but the whole campaign ended in a disaster. The emperor spent the next ten years dealing with another civil war and fighting the Fatimid Caliphate, leaving local governors to deal with Bulgar raids. In 996, Samuel, who was now the emperor of Bulgaria, marched into Thessaly with a big army, threatening Corinth. Basil was fighting in a conflict over the Emirate of Aleppo, so he appointed his most trusted general, Nikephoros Uranos, to face the Bulgars with his host. The armies camped across the river from each other for several days. One night Nikephoros forded the river and attacked the Bulgar camp at dawn. Surprised Bulgars couldn't mount a resistance and a lot of prisoners were taken, but the Tsar didn't sue for peace. In the year 1000, Basil took the charge himself once again. He set out to methodically recapture the territory lost in the west and isolate Samuel in his mountain's domain. Almost every season he campaigned, besieged fortresses, and reduced Samuel's holdings bit by bit. One by one, Pliska, Preslav, Vidin, and other cities fell into the Roman hands. We know that Basil won a major victory at Skopje in 1004, but after 1005, the chronicles don't provide details of his campaigns for almost a decade. Finally, in 1014, came his most famous triumph. Tsar Samuel himself rode with a big army to block Basil from entering Bulgarian heartland. He camped at a narrow pass near the village of Kluch or Clydion, and his soldiers fortified it with a wooden palisade. When Basil's forces approached the pass, the emperor ordered an immediate attack on the palisade, but it was repelled. He was considering withdrawing and trying his luck elsewhere, when his general, Nikephorus Cepheus, approached him with a suggestion. Cepheus had information about a steep pass around the high Belasitsa mountain. This passage would allow him to arrive at the rear of the Bulgarian army and attack them where they would not expect. The plan was successful. Cepheus' detachment struck the Bulgars from the rear, which made them abandon their fortifications to face a new threat. Taking advantage of the Bulgars' confusion, Basil's main force smashed through the palisade and routed Samuel's whole army. The Roman victory was complete, and a lot of prisoners were taken. The 70-year-old Tsar escaped the capture, but 15,000 of his men were less successful. This is when the Basil's most notorious deed occurred. According to John Skylitzis, Basil ordered to blind every prisoner, but spare one eye for one man in every hundred, so he can guide the rest home. 
when this gruesome procession arrived at the Bulgarian capital, Samuel died of a heart attack upon looking at them. This is how the legend goes. In reality, it would have been highly improbable to capture 15,000 men in a single battle, so the number of blinded Bulgars sounds exaggerated. But the blinding itself does sound like something Basil could do. He had a reputation of dealing out exemplary punishments. He hanged and impaled the rebels, and cut the hands of captives from a particularly stubborn Bedouin tribe, who resisted his rule for too long. Bulgaria had been a thorn in Basil's side for decades. He considered the Bulgars to be a part of his empire, and Samuel and his army were traitors, who refused to honor the pledge of Tsar Boris. Blinding in this case was a punishment for treason. A personal factor may also be intertwined in his decision. His close friend Theophilac Botaniatis had been killed in an ambush shortly after the Battle of Clydon concluded. But Basil does not seem to have been intent on exterminating the Bulgars. When the Bulgar resistance collapsed four years later, Basil wasn't cruel at all with his new subjects. He kept the Bulgarian church intact and made an effort to integrate the Bulgarian elite into the Roman society. Why then did he receive the title the Bulgar Slayer? Turns out he didn't have this title during his lifetime. He certainly wouldn't have liked it. Basil could be brutal when he deemed it pragmatic, but antagonizing the people he conquered just to boost was simply not his style. The Bulgar Slayer title did not appear until long after his death. In fact, he wasn't even the first to receive a nickname for killing the Bulgars. That would be the famous Viking Harald Hardrada. Hardrada served in the Varangian Guard for the Emperor Michael IV and participated in putting down the Bulgarian uprising of 1041. For his exploits in this campaign, Harald's court scald called him Bulgara Brenner, or the Bulgar Burner. Basil's famous title first appears only 160 years after his death, at the time of another Bulgar revolt, known as the Uprising of Asen and Peter. The author of this moniker is Nikitas Honiatis, the Byzantine historian. Honiatis was an imperial secretary and the governor of the theme of Philippopolis. When the Bulgars rose against Roman rule, Honiatis used the image of victorious emperor Vasileus Vulgaractonus to rally the Romans against the rebels. This propaganda bit was so successful that not only did the name stuck, but it also spawned imitators. This is where a second main character comes in. Kalayan, whose name can be translated as John the Handsome, was the younger brother of the rebellion leaders Ivan Asen and Peter. He assumed the sole rule of the new Bulgarian state in 1197, after both of his brothers were murdered. Kalayan seized the moment when the Eastern Roman Empire was weak, and resumed the war to capture the Roman possessions north of the Hemus Mountains. He went on campaign and took the cities of Skopje, Baranichevo and Constanza. At the siege of Varna, his soldiers constructed an enormous siege tower that was wider than the moat that surrounded the city walls. They used this tower as both a bridge and a ladder to scale the walls. On the third day of the siege, they entered the citadel and captured the city. According to the same Nikitas Honiatis, Kalayan ordered all of the surviving defenders to be thrown into the moat and buried alive. He considered it a retaliation for what Basil did to the Bulgars 200 years earlier. To drive the point home, he started styling himself as Rameo Beats, or the Roman Slayer. His most famous victory wasn't even against the Romans, but the so-called Latin Empire, which controlled Constantinople after the notorious Fourth Crusade. But we're not going to focus on it in this video. To solidify his reputation as the Roman Slayer, Kalayan devastated the surroundings of Constantinople in 1206. According to the Acropolites, the inhabitants of the Roman strongholds along Via Ignatia were forcefully moved to the lands on the Danube, where they were settled into new towns named after the ones from which they came. All of this happened in the aftermath of the First Crusade, so Kalayan's campaign met little opposition. All this pillaging and plundering triggered an exodus of the Romans of Thrace to the Empire of Nicaea, a newly established Roman state in Anatolia. Kalayan died in 1207 while besieging Thessalonica. According to the legend, he was slain by Saint Demetrius, the holy protector of the city. So there we have two quite different characters, with different stories, leading to the same reputation. The emperor who sought to integrate the Bulgarians into his state received a reputation for seeking to exterminate them from a later propagandist. The Tsar sought to match this reputation for his own people and set out on a brutal campaign that further alienated Bulgarians and Romans. 
The narrative of slayers became more entrenched in the early 20th century, when newly independent Bulgaria and Greece clashed over who should own what land in the Balkans. I set out to make this video as a simple tale of medieval dick measuring, but as I did more research, it became a story of how easy it is to sow enmity between the nations by exploiting the past conflicts. I trust the viewer to make his own conclusions, so all I can advise is to read more and to be wary of the tales of how good some ancient guy was at murdering a particular group of people. And also tune in for my next video about the pale death of the Saracen.